Welcome, listeners, to www.ironradio.org, the website and podcast for all things strength sports and sports nutrition. Thanks for listening. Good morning, everybody. You are on another episode of Iron Radio. This is Phil Stevens. I am a powerlifter, Highland Games athlete, strength coach, youth sport coach, and maker of many cool things. Ooh. Uh, this is Dr. Mike T. Nelson, associate professor at the Kerrigan Institute, creator of the Flex Diet Certification which, depending upon when you listen to this, is open for one more day. And it's Monday, January 22nd, 2024 at midnight. So flexdiet.com, shameless plug. And I am Lonnie Lowry. I've been a university professor for about 25 years now. i got to adjust these numbers. Mm-hmm. Um, working on a book right now, a uh, former competitive bodybuilder, that kind of stuff. All right. I have a listener mail, and I have a piece of news. Which would you guys want first? Listener mail about plastic exposure or science news about lumbar pain? Let's go with the lumbar pain first. Yeah. This is one I just stumbled on. Hadari and colleagues. So I was looking up some stuff on N-acetylcysteine, which is something that's interested me a lot. I've done a little bit of podcasting about it. It's cheap. It's like 10 bucks a bottle. Yeah. Um, but it's just a, you know a form of an amino acid, but it has very strong antioxidant qualities and age slowing qualities, if you will. If you look at different markers, um, I first stumbled on it through Psychology Today of all places because I was reading up on how it might help with long COVID brain fog. I'm like, hey, who doesn't you know have some interest in reducing brain fog these days? Anyway, this one is about lumbar pain radiating lumbar pain from pinched nerves and you know my wife deals with some of this so n-acetylcysteine as an add-on therapy is useful in treating acute lumbar uh, radiculopathy so just radiating nerve pain caused by disc herniation uh, results of a randomized controlled clinical trial so this is hidari and colleagues uh, reviews recent clinical trials 2023 it says available experimental and clinical evidence indicate that nac may have an analgesic role in specific pain conditions, particularly neuropathic pain. Now, again, because of the wide-reaching ways this works, like it, you know, once you strongly reduce oxidative stress, I mean, that could affect all kinds of things, right? So, mm-hmm. I mean, this is even sold as a mucolytic, like a mucus thinner. Really, just crazy, broad stuff. But it says, we designed a study to investigate the potential use of NAC adjunct treatment to NSAIDs, right? In this case, I think they use naproxen. In patients with acute radiculopathy secondary to lumbar intervertebral disc herniation. So that made me think, well, it's not just relevant to my family. This is relevant to lifters who a lot of them, I've known a lot of guys who've had like spinal reconstructions and crushed discs and all that kind of stuff. I mean, you, it's the rare individual, I think, who can make it into his 50s uh, and not have some kind of disc compression or something when you're putting four, five, six, eight hundred pounds or more, you know, on your back. Anyway, 62 patients diagnosed with with this condition associated with disc herniation were randomly assigned to NAC or placebo. Besides naproxen, at a dose of 500 milligrams twice a day, they also did either the NAC or placebo. So this is an a- add-on. If you think about like medical stuff, you might think, well, why why are they doing the naproxen and everybody? Well, you can't withhold treatment. So they're kind of saying, here's standard treatment, and then we're going to add on. It says a comparison of a visual analog scale, you know, just sad face to happy face kind of point on this, you know, chart, and uh, disability scores. Uh, At weeks two and four, the treatment between the two groups did not show a significant difference. In contrast, from weeks four to week eight, we noticed significantly greater reduction in the visual analog scale and these, you know, this disability scale in the NAC group compared to the placebo group. Uh, so P less than 0.001 for you stats nerds. So mm-hmm. highly re- reproducible. It says also NAC treated patients improved more uh, than the placebo patients uh, in treatment success defined as very much or much improved again on these different scales. So you wouldn't expect anything in month one, but according to these data in month two, if you keep at it and typically uh, what do they give? I think it's 600 milligrams twice a day. So for eight weeks was the study. So a typical pill, I have some of this around here. So one in the morning, one in the evening kind of deal. 
it's one of those things almost like fish oils in that it seems to affect a variety of different things. And that suggests it does something fundamentally helpful. It could also throw a red flag. Like, how can this help all these different things? Mm -hmm. But in this case, I don't know, maybe uh, some of this nerve pain has this like oxidative stress and inflammation kind of component. And NAC, it, you know, it's a strong antioxidant. So, uh, yeah, I just thought anybody out there who does deal with back pain, I think I've got some damaged discs, like cervical discs, because my arms go numb. You know, so I'm going to give it a go as well. I'll see what happens in my wife. I can report back and see, you know, let everybody know what's going on. But uh, yeah, NAC, it's cheap. It might be something you could add to your naproxen or, you know, stretching the, this a little bit, even your ibuprofen or whatever and said you lean on uh, and might help, might help. Do you have any thoughts, Lonnie, about staying on NAC for just general immune health long term? I I tend to just use it on and off. Like if I have more stress or my HRV is weird or I feel like I'm coming down with something or when I was traveling more, I would use a higher-ish dose, you know, one, two caps, which I know compared to some people isn't real high for a period of time. And the, But I don't tend to use it on a daily basis just because I'm I don't know enough to know if I'm down regulating some stuff I might want to be up regulating. Do you yeah. know what I mean? Yeah, I do. I, I mean, anytime I see antioxidants, I think about the studies with C, vitamin C and E yeah, and how C they can and yeah, reduce and, yeah, yeah. muscle growth. And maybe that was specific to C and E for all I know. You know, it I know that to be from what I've seen. Yeah. Yeah, me too, right? Which is same, seems weird because, yeah. and make no mistake, NAC is weird. Uh, I would point anybody, like type in N-acetylcysteine psychology today, and you'll see an article about what it does to uh, all these different cognitive and kind of mood disturbances. Uh, go to National Library of Medicine, type it in. It seems to do a lot of different things. So like you, one to two capsules, AM, PM, and then see you know what it does. It doesn't look like the kind of thing that's going to heavily interact with a lot of other meds, but I'm not telling yeah. you to go ask your doctor, right? But – yeah, agreed. Um, I'm going to give it a go, though, a more intensive run for, oh, totally. for two months. And then we'll see if my arms stop going numb. Partly my arms are going numb because I've got crutches up under my armpits mm. right now. Oh, yeah. And, and that's pushing on everything that was already irritated. So yeah. uh, anyway, we'll see. We'll see if it over overcomes the problems my wife and I have with uh, bad backs. Yeah. And for some gut stuff, I have used it on, you know, little gut protocols I use if someone has digestive issues, but, you know, it's not like a, you know, clinical thing, or at least they don't have any diagnosis of it. It seems to help with that. There was some stuff on NAC helping with uh, sinus infections, too. So a few <laughs> clients who have recurrent sinus infections it helps with their gut and it seemed to help with them um, uh, not getting sinus infections as much either. So cool. Yeah. It's the time of year for that kind of crap. Yes, yeah. And you know what? Like I said, it, it's just refreshing to look at something that has some evidence behind it, and it's not 30 or 40 bucks a bottle, <laughs> you know? So. Yeah. And the FDA did try to pull it off the market, but they were luckily not successful, so it's still around. Yeah, sold as a drug. That also caught my eye. There's a couple of supplements that used to be sold as drugs or are sold as drugs in other countries. Yep. And NAC is on that list. Pretty cool. All right, and then I have a bit from Dave Fryers. Dave always sends good stuff, educated dude. What's the disease burden from plastic exposure? So I'll just set this up. This is back in the news, right? I mean, we've all talked about micro and nanoplastics and that kind of stuff. Broad brush, I always saw it like you, you could get microplastics that technically I think you could see. Like if you're scraping a butter container with a serrated knife, Okay, you might have little shavings or tiny little bits, but nanoplastics in some ways are even scarier because they're so small, you're, you'll absorb them into your blood. You know, so yikes. But let me get to this piece here sent from Dave. Exposure to endocrine disrupting chemicals via daily use of plastics is a major contributor to the overall disease burden in the United States and the associated cost to society amount to more than 1% of gross domestic product mm. revealed, revealed a large scale analysis. This research was in the journal of the Endocrine Society. So this is not some alarmist, uneducated alarmist or something. Mm -hmm. It says, taken together, the disease burden attributable, attributable to these endocrine disruptors 
used in the manufacture of plastics added up to almost $250 billion in 2018 alone. Wow. I'm going to jump around a little bit. Lead author Leonardo Trasand, he's an MD amongst other things. He talks about this. It says the, these chemicals have been shown to leach out of the containers and disturb the body's hormone systems, increasing the risk for cancer, diabetes, reproductive disorders, neurological impairments in developing fetuses and children, and even death. Trasand told Medscape Medical News some of the, the tips that he has can be quite simple. It says to use an example, and I don't agree with this one. When you're flying, fill up a stainless steel container after clearing security. If there's a time for a plastic bottle, I think I'm going to do that in the airport. But in any case, I mean, you, out, you have to do after security anyway because of the fluid content. But it says at home, use glass or stainless steel rather than plastic bottles and containers. I think we've heard this over the years. Mm-hmm. In particular, and I've heard this too, I'm sure we all have, avoiding microwaving in plastic is important, Trasand said, even if the container says it's microwave safe. So there's more here, but... I, I think they're, they did sort of this health economics, you know, uh, outcomes research, the HEOR kind of approach here. And they're like, wow, this stuff is, you know, damaging, costly. It has a real health cost to it. So it's funny when you talk to different people, they have different opinions on this stuff. Like, for example, I microwave bags of broccoli sometimes or cauliflower. I know I, I probably shouldn't do that. My, my mom's like, I would never do that. I'm like, well, it's either that or don't eat the broccoli, you know. Mm. Uh, so uh, how do you guys deal with the plastics thing? Do you even encounter that much, Phil, since you do a lot of stuff on your own? Yeah, but, well, I mean, that's what I was going to say is like, even if you're cognizant about not using plastic in today's age, you're using plastic. Yes. Like it's fucking everywhere. Yep. Like your organic food is wrapped in plastic. You're, you know, you go to the store and everything is wrapped in plastic. I mean, there's no getting around it. Um, we purposely use, like he said, like we use glass cups and glass plates and glass storage bowls, <clears throat> things like that. We limit it as much as we can because, I mean, the evidence is out there. It's like, well, man, it's easy. Like, my glass bowls are just as much as the plastic ones, so might as well just go with glass. Uh, you know, limit it as much as we can, but, uh, I mean, you're not going to get away from it. Yeah. <laughs> you know, no. For God's sakes, our plumbing now is all fucking plastic. Oh, right. Like they came oh, in yeah. two years ago and replaced our main, main water line that had been here since like 1940. And it's not a line. And now guess what it is? It's plastic. Uh, like it's if, even if you're avoiding it, you're not. So <laughs> Right. That's my that's son's best. approach. Yeah. yeah. For us, our kind of new newest thing that has been helpful for some of our people is so they have these little like – heatable lunch boxes that you can get on which again i would say too you never know the quality of the like metals that you're getting from cheap metal you know so i mean you probably could end up in the same situation there when you're just buying cheap metals that are you know from just from china or a similar situation anyway it's just like you plug them into either like your what used to be the lighter and they heat up your food Without the like, without a microwave or whatever, I've played around with that. I've liked it quite a bit, as far as just avoiding the microwave, microwaving stuff. And it usually comes with like a little metal container, like that's the one I have. Will it cook it, Jarrell, or is it just for warming? It's just for warming. It won't, so it doesn't get. And my thing, I don't, I hate microwaving anything because yeah. I just feel like it dries it out, and just makes it taste gross. But I shouldn't say gross. I I do it when I have to, but this is a little bit better, a little bit more gentle um, way to heat up your food. So just something simple like that has helped out a lot because usually it's the convenience aspect that my people struggle with. You know, I have people who are like in sales and they're traveling all the time. So, you know, they're always stopping in quick trip and, Mm -hmm. you know, obviously everything's going to be plastic. It kind of sucks, but. So, yeah, I, I that's the one thing we've kind of shifted to. And I've mentioned it a little bit in terms of, like, just education as far as, like, look, these plastics are not great. And it is tough because I actually have a client who that's, like, his job. Not a client. His, her, <laughs> her husband is in. Literally, that's his. It's, like, saran wrap type plastics. Mm-hmm. That's, like, what he sells. So that's, like, his <laughs> career. But... <laughs> Uh, 
but yeah, that's like the best, the best, you know, convenience solution that we've had as far as in the last, you know, year is kind of suggesting that people do something like that where you, you have something that warms it up, it's in a little metal container and you can take it with you on the go. Cause the convenience part is where, I mean, you're going to get most of the plastic aspects for us. Yeah. That's, I do a lot of the same thing. Like my lifesaver is an air fryer. Like we got one at home and now I have one at the gym and warehouse and like, holy shit. It's, you know, it's so amazing. And I think the biggest problem with the microwave is the consistency of the food, meaning like the, uh, yes. the, the mouth feel. It's like, Oh my God. Like different than, you know, I can throw it in a freaking air fryer for eight minutes and it's done and it doesn't taste like a pile of mush. Uh, that's the other thing that we've done is that and just uh like i said glass and metal and uh, yeah but just do what uh, you not, can yeah you do what you can but i'm not dumb enough to think that i'm avoiding it like holy shit no. everything is you know, covered in it jerrell mentioned the quality <laughs> of the metals and stuff like if you look inside a pop can it's like a lot of this stuff a lot of these metals are lined with plastic like mm-hmm. there's actually the, a film of plat and you're like oh god like what do i you know like point taken it's nice to be able to warm things up yeah. With just a heating element or in a more natural way. Or Right now we have some natural peanut butter my wife picked up that's in a plastic jar. And I usually get that smuckers in a glass jar. Because yeah. to me, it seems like especially the fatty things that you would microwave would be even worse as far as leaching stuff out. I, I don't know if that's true. I'm not a lipid chemist. but Well, and the uh, length of time it's going to be in there. Like, holy yeah. shit, just the time you're going to have that jar of peanut butter. You're not going to pound that peanut butter down in a day. No, right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so I like so. the glass ones when I can't. It just seems like an oxymoron. Here's your natural peanut butter. The whole marketing ploy is natural, and it's in plastic. The one that cracks me up is the people like, don't use the plastic bag at the grocery store. Like, like literally every fucking thing I'm putting in that little plastic bag <laughs> is, <laughs> is wrapped in plastic already. <laughs> so. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, totally. Like, come on. I I know this is one of those things. It's you can be aware, mm-hmm. um, but uh, yeah, how much are you really gonna? I mean, like you said, I mean, think about how medicine has been transformed by plastic. Or you know, I had some friends who are like, you never really recycle plastics the way you do other things. They just the whole chain lifestyle or lifespan chain of plastics is just not very pretty and they don't r- truly get recycled and i'm like what are you supposed to do like it keeps things in medicine sterile or clean uh, or in the grocery store Wh- what do you do mike what do you do with this kind of stuff um we had a microwave for quite a while and then it broke and mm-hmm. i we realized after a couple of weeks we didn't use it as much as we thought <laughs> And then the coffee area expanded, and we didn't have room for the microwave, and I was too cheap to buy another one. So we still nice. don't have one seven years later. <laughs> don't have one anymore either. Yeah. I mean, uh, no other. The one thing I did notice, though, is that it did kind of force me to slow down a little bit before meals. So I'll still have proteins pre made and everything in the fridge pre made, and we'll just heat it up on a cast iron stove. Or we just got one of the new ceramic pans, which is really amazing. And just that couple extra minutes to, you know, slow down and take a few breaths and not feel like you're throwing in the microwave for 30 seconds and inhaling your food as you're walking around. So I found it was actually probably a little bit better. I mean, again, I, my master's was on zapping monkeys with microwaves, so I don't think the microwave itself is the issue. But <clears throat> you can have some leaching from... Uh, plastics in microwaves, which has been documented. Uh, saran wrap is by far the worst. The more pliable plastics seem to be the worst. Um, but we do store some stuff in the fridge in plastic. It's already been cooked. It's not a temperature. Is it probably the best idea? Eh, I don't know. It's hard to say. It's not being heated up. It's it's cold. Um, it's going to be in there for you know a few days. And then outside of that, the other biggest tip I got for travel and stuff is uh, we have just one of the, like, a hydro flask that works really well. Um, shout out to Phil. We bought a bunch <laughs> from him that are work really, really good for clients. And then the other tip I got is the old school, they're kind of like the thermos brand, kind of cylindrical, wide mouth uh, thermoses. Mm-hmm. You can heat food up, 
And as you're heating your food up, just pour some hot water in the container and let it sit. And then once your food is hot, just put it in one of those containers, dump the hot water out. And it surprisingly stays pretty hot for like four to six hours pretty easily. Um, so it is more time. You do have to kind of prep it in, in the morning. Um, but I got that from Stan Efferding. And that was then, it's one of those things I started doing probably four years ago now. And so when I'll travel or even going to the airport or something like that, if, if I have time or being more strict with nutrition, and I've done it with clients a lot too, that because I, I don't, I'm do not want to eat one more cold chicken breast in my life. I just, oh, I, know. <laughs> I can do it. But man, it is so far down on my list. And just even having it be warm. But if you're somewhere where you have nothing to heat it up, the fact that it's already warm, I will eat it way more often than if it was just cold and sitting in the cooler. <laughs> yeah. If, no, if you though, eat more. Probably, yeah. Okay. Yeah. This is probably the worst part about this is those silly, goofy mason jar bros were right. And in... Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And those we have a fair amount of those, yeah. Goddamn hipsters were correct. <laughs> yeah, we have yes. I'll tell you yeah. what, one of the cool things we've got for stores now is uh, off Amazon. We just bought it like two weeks ago. They have four of your mason jars. They have a little vacuum sealer. Costs like 18 bucks. And yeah. all you do is, you know, the little metal cap and not the ring itself. You just put the cap on, you slide this thing on, hit it for 30 seconds, it vacuum seals it. And throw it in the fridge. And like we thought, you know how guacamole will turn like brown overnight? Nope, not anymore. You can store really? that it's in there for yeah, it's yeah. amazing. It takes cool. thirty seconds. So my so I was mentioning this at the gym the other day too. Yeah. So yeah, I oh. heard that. It takes like thirty seconds, you seal it up and throw it in the fridge. And it's and then you just pop it off. It'll push, push when you pop the cap and then you can take whatever out, put it right back in. It's it's amazing little thing. I would like to see a big list of like, here are 20 things that you can do to at least reduce yeah. your exposure. Cause it does concern me that, you know, cancer and is neck and neck with heart disease and a lot of these different, you know, epidemiological studies. And it makes you wonder, like if we're living less long than our parents or grandparents, but that's not cool. And it does make you wonder, I mean, because of the giant corporations involved and everything else, you know, there's going to have to be a lot of pushback or personal choices made about this plastic stuff. I do know a guy, uh, my buddy Steve, he's a nutrition scientist. He has done deep dives with this. He's not concerned about BPA, at least. Now, there's more than just BPA going on in mm. some of these plastics, I guess. But maybe I should try to see if I can't get him uh, on the show. Um, but he's like, it doesn't really matter that much for for BPA, and here's why. If I'm remembering that right, I'll, maybe I'll just check in with him privately and see what he says. But uh, yeah, I, I don't like the idea of I don't want to get cancer when I'm 60. I, in my mind, I got 20 years after that. You know what I mean? I don't, especially if I can just prevent it. But it seems like there's going to be some front end prep kind of thing. Buy something like Mike, get in a habit of something. Um, my biggest problem is I'm going to have to start. If I want, if I wanted to go that route, is boils my broccoli <laughs> on the stove? Like Mike said, take a few extra yeah. minutes or something. I don't know. I well, just the, the likelihood we're going to get cancer at some point is like damn near one hundred percent high. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, so but yeah. why not at least fucking try and limit that a little bit? To how we can, you know, right? So yeah, quick tip for boiling broccoli that people probably already know is if you take a, a wide, like a, a high lip uh, frying pan, like a stainless steel one or ceramic one, put the water in the bottom there, put it on a large burner, it'll heat up and boil <clears throat> much faster than putting a lot of water in a smaller saucepan. Mm -hmm. yeah. So that'll save you like three to five minutes, which once I figured that out, like just recently, I'm like, that was actually enough time where I do it more often now versus skipping it. So sometimes little tips like that can be yeah, helpful. good to know. Yeah, because I got to I got to move in that direction. What I'm doing right now with just throw the bag in, it's just too easy. You know, while I'm getting oh, my so other easy. stuff yeah. ready for work, five minutes and then my broccoli is cooked. Mm -hmm. You know, and it, if it means not eating the broccoli, I guess you know I've actually asked some other nutritionists about this too. There's one in particular I'm thinking of, Tiffany, and she's like, "Would you not eat broccoli otherwise?" I said, "No, I probably wouldn't." She said, "Then microwave it." Yeah. You know, so <laughs> yeah, it's just a hard. It's a hard one, but one tip from food science before we go to break. 
uh, I remember they used to have us put exactly the right amount of water in the broccoli. So the water was evaporated when the broccoli was tender. Now, nobody's going to measure that exactly. Over time, yeah. you might get that good. But it does kind of point out that don't use so much water. And Mike's comment made me think of this, that you're dumping out all this green water that's leached yep. out a bunch of phytochemicals and B vitamins and stuff. That's not cool either. So anyway. Yeah. All right. Uh, let's go to break. Uh, and then we come back. Phil, can you set this up? What exactly yep. would, you, would you call the title? Yep. Where to go if you're in search of further education in athletic training, I guess. I don't know. Like where would we suggest to go? Right. Uh, yeah. Certifications. Yeah. Um, certifications versus skills. versus self education or something. I don't know. Yeah, we were all over so. the place before we hit the record. Yeah. Button. <laughs> hey, everybody! Iron Radio is back and in an expanded way. What can you expect? Well, first, you can get it simulcast every week on the NutritionRadio.org network as well as on the original podcast. It'll appear regularly on iTunes, Spotify, and all your favorite podcasting sites. We have a new Iron Radio slash Nutrition Radio Facebook page as well. Please check us out. We're even backed up on YouTube. We hope that an expanded presence will get you the news, education, banter, and guests that's made Iron Radio's community so loyal from the start. You are appreciated. Okay, everybody, we're back. And the topic we're going to discuss is I've just had several clients come up to me in the last month, and they've all had the same question. And it's basically they don't want to be... They're not looking to be a trainer or a coach, but they're looking to expand their knowledge so they could like help other people that train with them and stuff like that, like just friends. And they're like, what's personal certification, uh, personal training certification should I get? And I'm like, well, uh, none. <laughs> 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 because basically, and I tell them, and I'm dead. Like I always do, and I catch shit for some people. I try to be just brutally honest with them, and it's like, really, the only reason to get any of the ACE, ISSA, whatever certifications is to work at a commercial gym, and like the right one to get is the one that that gym's in bed with and requires you to get to have a job there. Um, I was like, and just explaining them, in my opinion, and we'll get your guys' opinion on this stuff, is like. The better way, if you're just looking for personal knowledge, is explore it yourself. Save save the money you're going to pay them, a thousand dollars or whatever it is, and mainly buy educational grade text and start reading. Uh, you know, so I start pointing in the books. Like here, here's the way I would go. I would start with this book and get a basic knowledge of this, and then it, it always delves into one thing that I think is missed in the coaching field is just a basic knowledge like very basic knowledge of physics and things like that lever arms and uh because i think that's missed by many like there's many people that i know the coach and you start asking them about lever arms and shit they have no fucking idea what they're talking about and in my mind every single basic lift especially compound lifts that we do can be broken down into lever arms and centers of gravity and things like that so you need to have an understanding of it um and that goes further with, with individuals and their lever arms. But, uh, yeah, so I, just, I start pointing them towards text and articles and things like that. And a big one like we talked about before the show is, like, I might tell them, you know, start here. Read Tudor Bompa's book on periodization. And then go over here and read this that's going to totally be the fucking opposite of that. Um, <laughs> and it's going to shit all over it. And But now what you need to do is start looking – where these principles intersect because they all do. Um, so I don't know your guys' thoughts. Like first off, I guess is if somebody, if you have a client that's just looking for to broaden their knowledge in the subject, I, I guess it's people are pointed that way because they think that's where the education comes from. It's like, Oh, there's where I get my super base knowledge of education. These people are paying a thousand dollars to be a PT. And, uh, so I'll just yeah. go there. Uh, but it's hard to explain to them. Like a lot of the shit they're teaching, you're going to want to forget it. Like you're just getting that <laughs> to get the job. So, yeah, I mean, actually, and this is a long time ago, but you remember like West side had like a little third thing they were doing for a while when, you know, this is a long time ago, maybe probably 10 plus years ago. 
but Louis actually had a list of books that was like basically this, right? The yeah. the basic books. Like I started with Tudor Bampa. He had a basic physics book in there. Um, <clears throat> and I just, and he put the book list out and, you know, he's posting his articles for free. So I like, quote unquote, took the course, but I never paid for anything. I just bought the books for yeah. cheap off like Amazon and kind of went through that. Um, I, I mean, for most of these certifications, you're not paying for the information, you're paying for the tests. Mm -hmm. And, and like, you know, obviously the certification to, you know, be able to the, apply to whatever jobs, which who even knows, like half the college strength and conditioning, not half, but there's a significant amount of college strength and conditioning coaches who don't have any certification. And we always find this out after like some big name school <laughs> gives everybody rhabdo and then, you know, <laughs> this guy's not even certified in anything. Yeah, I think starting with like, uh, I'm trying to think of it. I think it's called Anatomy Without a Scalpel. Um, some basic books like there, before you dig deep, I usually mm -hmm. say like start start at the shallow level and then start digging from there is kind of how I start people. If they just want to in increase their knowledge of the subject. And then for, I mean, some of the people that I've followed most recently that I've helped out a lot or that have helped me out a lot is I like, uh, Oh my gosh. Is it Joel Jameson? And his, yeah, he has like a book. It's like great. MMA, MMA, MMA conditioning. conditioning. Yeah. yeah. That's, that's like one of the better books on conditioning I've ever mm -hmm. yep. read, purchased even up to this point. Um, and that, as far as like an actual cert, I mean, I would do some of the cheaper ones maybe that are like, like I think the power athlete one is pretty good. That'll give you some mm -hmm. base strength and conditioning stuff. But otherwise, yeah, I don't, the cert itself, if you're not trying to get into a organized space, I don't really see the, the value in the cert itself. But Well, and also I think if you like, if somebody can sit down, and they'll make it through Tudor Bumpa's book. You've proven to me. You've proven to me. You have a real interest in this field because oh, yeah. it's like reading stereo instructions. You know, it is not an enjoyable fucking read. Uh, but you know, it's very academic, which is what you're looking for. But if you're looking for knowledge, it's there. Um, and then you know, I also point them towards. I always have a list of like articles, and most of them are oddly enough from like 20 years ago, before the. <laughs> the article field went to shit. <clears throat> like when people were still getting actually paid and they had good knowledgeable yeah. people in the field. Um, but there's a lot of that. And then, like I said, West side of course is one that I go to. And I was like, yeah, just be prepared that like everything you learned about periodization is just going to be fucking shit on. Uh, <laughs> 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 I literally, like, there's, like none of it's there. And, uh, you know, you're going to be going max effort and this and that all the time. And, uh, but, yeah, I mean, other than that, I mean, and nobody wants to do this anymore. And we've talked about it numerous times. It's like time with people doing it. Like yep. invest a fucking weekend, a week, whatever. And like most coaches actually doing it would love for you to just come in, sit down, shut up and watch. You know? <laughs> and they'll just let you do it if you reach out to them. Uh, like, hey, I just want to shadow you and watch what you're doing. And, uh, if you can do that, holy, sh your, your, your knowledge base will expand greatly. Uh, but then it's also explaining to these people, like, like half the battle is the knowledge. Half the battle of helping people is the knowledge that you're going to find in text. The other half is the years spent <clears throat> under the bar actually coaching people. And you can't right. rush that. That's the thing that's hard to rush. It's like, okay, I know all these concepts. I know all these things. How do I implement them? And, and there's no fast track to implementing them. I mean, <laughs> it's like, why? who do I use this on? Why do I use this on them? And it, that, a lot of that knowledge just comes just from, from hands-on experience. experience. Yeah. yeah, that's the tough part. And in today's world of, you know, everybody's like the girl that eats too many blueberries on Willy Wonka. I want it. I want it now. <laughs> yeah, Violet, yeah, you know, Violet. and it's like uh, uh, it's hard to fast track that. And I love that. I, I doubt he came up with it, but Elon Musk says, "I don't confuse schooling with education." 
And I love that quote, right? Because schooling is not the only way to get educated on a topic. Ultimately, we're all self learners, you know, self educators kind of thing. The government has a nice approach to this too. And we've all heard KSA, right? It's not just knowledge, not just K, but what about skills and abilities? Mm -hmm. And the K, the, the K you can get in an academic classroom really well. The good thing about like a university degree or a good certification is it's scaffolded, right? You start with the basics, like in nutrition, here are the six classes of nutrients. Let's address each of them one at a time, you know, or in exercise physiology, you know, there's a, what are the components of physical fitness? Here's a body comp class. Here's a strength conditioning class. Here's an aerobic, mm -hmm. you know, endurance. And you kind of get the, the map, a uh, roadmap of where everything is. That way, when you get new information, you can plug it into your map and it makes sense. I mean, I think we all memorize things in these like folders in our brains. And so by having some car compartments, it helps to do that in a scaffolded way. Mm -hmm. But yeah, then I tell undergrads all the time what you just said, Phil, you've got to go shadow. You don't, it doesn't have to be some big paid internship BS. Just go mm -hmm. watch for two days. Yep. Uh, and then you could start to make some of your own determinations. And I know you did that early on. Mm -hmm. Like you watch one guy and then you watch another guy and he's teaching something different. And you can, you know, come up with your own. Like I like some of what he said and some of what yep. she said. And now I got the bill. You know? Yeah. And that's oh, like one of my big pet peeves for people is is the opposite of that is they'll they'll decide to shadow somebody. And they'll. They'll shadow one person for five years. <laughs> and what happens is they become a very poor carbon copy of that coach. Let's compare it. Yeah. And it's like, no, that's not what, like, literally, like, you're better off. I would rather you see shadow 40 people for four days than one person for whatever that is, 40 times four. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Uh, it's, and just, yeah, and just, like, literally get a breadth of knowledge from tons of different coaches, even coaches that you, like, you watch their stuff online and you don't agree with a lot of it. Shut the fuck up. Go there. Don't say a word and just watch. They're going to have something. You know, even if you learn what you don't want to do, you're going to learn something. You know, <laughs> like, oh, fuck, I'm not doing that. They're an asshole. <laughs> you know, whatever. They don't know what the hell they're talking about. You learned it. You know, it's it, and you need to become yourself. And that's the same thing with reading all these books. Yeah. OK, he's telling me this. He's telling me this. He's telling me this. Now you have to have the time to digest it all and use it and figure out what works in all that stuff. Like like me as a coach, I'll use every different kind of training I've ever learned about from conjugate to periodization to blah, blah. And, and it's like find out what works in, in all this stuff and works for who. Like, what if this person really responds well to that and that person doesn't? We have to we have to figure that out. A lot of that's just time. And, <laughs> you know, even with a new client, like, I can't tell you when Jim Bob walks in the door that he's going to really respond well to this. That's going to take us yeah. time. And that's the tough part about taking on clients is, you know, they, what can you off? What can we do in three months? Well, I don't know yet, man. Uh, I don't even know what the hell you respond well to. That's going to take us the three months. You know, at least. So, mm -hmm. I mean, I guarantee we'll make progress, but we won't make your best progress until we figure out what works well for you. One of my concerns sometimes is whether it's nutrition or coaching or exes or whatever it is. And I really got a big, you know, earful of this watching Ripito give a talk ages ago. We are down in Texas. I think it was at an ASEP meeting. And basically he was like posing this, alternative to periodization and where i'm going with this is professional societies they get a hold of like their scope what they want to kind of embrace and sell just like you were saying what does the gym who are they in bed with what do they expect same thing with professional groups mm -hmm. like he was kind of saying you know do you really think you're going to see a lot of articles published in nsca journals that rip on periodization at the time probably not because yeah. That's their party line, yes. you know, and it's similar with a lot of the early days with nutrition. We've all had these discussions, but a lot of my fellow dietitians, 
they weren't really down with real high protein diets. They thought they were damaging in various ways. And so why would I, when I collected data on kidney function or on bone density, I'm like, look, this didn't hurt, hurt people at all. It yeah. didn't hurt healthy people at all. Am I going to go to one of those journals? Or Well, probably uh-huh. not because yeah. th- that's not what they embrace for the most part. Yes. Now, you might say, but but that's good science. You know, it's like, but th- that's not – when a professional group adopts something as their party line, now there's money involved because they're yeah. teaching people to get their cert- certification that periodization – Linear periodization is the bomb or yeah. that protein can be overdone and, and could be dangerous. <clears throat> you, you see what I mean? And that's why it's a good idea. Like you said, you go to a textbook. My outlook on that as a teacher is then you get some structure. Like yeah. where can you have alternate viewpoints on different things? Like you, you brought up individual differences. You'll get answers to that in a good textbook, intro textbook or a audit a university freshman class or, you know, sophomore class or something, because it'll tell you, like, here are universal training principles, overload, reversibility, you know, things like that, diminishing returns. There are these training things that we've talked about on this show, and those are more universal, but then there's a lot of individual differences, and that's where you need the S and the A when it comes to KSAs, Mm -hmm. right? So you can tailor this to individuals who aren't responding in some way. Like, what are they struggling with? Uh, yeah, so it, it is a good point, and I guess we're giving a very agnostic, like we're not in bed with any one group. I mean, I mentioned the NSCA. A lot of groups will look for that certificate as a strength coach. But then, you know, as you dig into it, there's also what the Collegiate Strength Conditioning Coaches Association or mm-hmm. whatever, the CSCCA. So also something a lot of universities require. So, yeah, you end up, feeling like you're you're not legitimate unless you're one of them and they'll all yeah. pitch that to you nutrition and exercise science you're not legitimate unless you have our cert and um i just disagree with that yeah well and i think it's like anything in life like if you're going to here's my hard stance i believe in this like okay if you do that then you better at least have a pretty good understanding of the argument that's the polar opposite of yours like, if you're going to tell me, I believe in this, you know, and it's no different in strength and conditioning and, and athletics. It's like, okay, I really believe in linear periodization. Well, okay, that's fine. What do you know about this? But well, what do you know about conjugate? Well, I don't know anything about it. Well, how do you really believe in that <laughs> if you don't even have a fucking clue what the other thing is? <laughs> you know? And it's like, get as much varied knowledge as you can. And even if it's just to prove your point. But I, when people have like this hardline stance on something, like this is the way, like, like they they're a goddamn Mandalorian, and <laughs> <laughs> and but they have no understanding of the other way, like well how do you really know that? And like get as much knowledge as you can, even if you end up throwing that out, you have a reason yeah. to, because you actually know it. Um, you can also end up getting stuck in a system like, yes, you, I mean. Uh, West Side is where I experienced this the most, actually, which is you know ironic because they had the some of the best entrance to like training information, like synthesized training information. You know, early two thousands when I was like starting to look, but like if you got caught like really stuck in the like you know box squatting bands, the chains, and like mm-hmm. like I've seen a lot of people not make as much progress as they could have if they just did something simpler, you know, just by getting stuck in the brand kind of thing. Um, so the more you're kind of reaching out to like do other things and weightlifting, it gets bad too, because you know, you got like the Chinese weightlifting team is doing something different and all this, but if you get stuck in that way and that style of training, it's like, you don't really, you don't really have the, I don't know, weapons to, kind of think for yourself to like discard things from it that that wouldn't work i mean for example with the chinese weightlifting stuff it would be um so most of their lifters if you look at a lot of their like the body style of chinese lifters is pretty similar right so mm-hmm. it's like kind of a long torso short legs mm-hmm. so their programming choices a lot of times are selected based on that like they don't need to squat as much right like squat as often but they do almost they pull heavy almost every day yeah but if you have long femurs and or you know long longer legs and a shorter torso 
you as a lifter might benefit more from squatting mm-hmm. more often like the Eastern European guys and girls do. They squat, you know, four to seven, you know, times days a week or whatever, kind of more moderate. So you get, if you get stuck, you know, like you can end up training for a style or in a training style that doesn't really suit your mm-hmm. needs. And you don't, if you never expand, you just kind of get stuck doing the same stuff not making progress where you could easily make some progress doing something a little bit different. Yeah. No, yeah. and a lot of that right there is just proof and point that goes back to a basic understanding for strength coaches of anatomy and physics. You know, if you don't understand that, you like you don't know what to have a long limb versus short limb lifter do. You know? Right. <laughs> and that can help so much and uh, like that is those two areas are the number one areas that I see people that are interested in in coaching like skip they they like delve into programming 100 percent, and then they have no understanding of the human body and how it works and how the, it differs like that everybody's like hip angles different knee length you know femur length like they just have no clue of that and it's like how are yeah. you implementing this stuff well, how would you That's explain a huge part well like a mm-hmm. um high bar versus low bar squat like yeah. the lever arms are essential to that argument right explaining why a low bar squat does this and a high bar squat does that, well, you know, yeah. or why you pull a barbell and a deadlift, keep it along your shins for the most part and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. I mean, well, yeah, and, yeah. And why maybe like what, what style of squat is going to be best for the person that has a really long torso and short femurs. Yes. Totally. Like the minute I throw him in a low bar squat and pitch him over more, mm. Oh, it's not a good thing. You know? Yeah. But for the other person like me that has a really short torso and long legs, Maybe we do need to go to that and and lay more into their hips and stuff. But on the vice versa, what do I need to train? Like me as a short torso, longer limb lifter, it's going to suck to do high bar. So I probably need to do a bunch of that, you know, at Mm -hmm. least at an assistance level to strengthen up my weaknesses. (laughs) It's interesting. Yeah. What, what Jarrell was saying about, and then you get biases, even regional biases because of just certain genetic tendencies, different parts of the world, whatever it might be. Yes, And they think this is the way to do it. And for them, yeah. it's population specificity. That's like a basic research concept. Like yeah. it's specific to that population. And so that's why they do that. Yeah. But I wanted to touch on one thing that, that Jarrell said. He used the word system. Man, we have to be so careful in a, a world of the Internet where everybody's got their own system. Mm-hmm. So practical tip without just going into, you know, old fart mode, get off my lawn, which is don't listen to all these gurus. Pay attention to stuff. Like people say, my bias is this. Like Mike, you do this all the time. My bias is this. So you can work with a high carb or a low carb client and you're kind of just neutral. You know, Mm -hmm. you're like, well, what, what do you want? What's working for you? And let's apply this, you know, research says this research says that because you could cherry pick studies to back up anything you want these days, almost anything you want. If you're, you know, unethical, but what I don't like is when people come up with these BS systems, like, well, after lifting, you know, uh, for muscle mass, there's this anabolic phase and then it fades into the recovery and then the flow phase. Like you made that shit up. You made that up. So don't make that stuff up Uh, because what it does to me, as far as I'm concerned, is it disrespects decades, uh, you know, a hundred years of what is real. Like there is a real body of literature out there that's been tested by, you know, small hypothesis and and observation after observation. We've built this knowledge base. Don't just throw that out the window. That should be a red flag to anybody as a consumer that, hey, you know, they're saying why everybody is wrong. And these are all the new rules. No, no, wrong. Uh, you you made that stuff up to create your own niche. And I mean, every niche has been filled. So now you get more and more idiotic, right, systems that are getting developed because they want their niche. Mm-hmm. So because they have to have something to market. They want to feel unique and special. Well, that's not a good idea. And, and again, yeah. yeah. So back to the original point, that's why some of these basic level textbooks or someone from someone who's educated in one way or the other, academics or experience or preferably some of both. But, you know, they get um, this agnostic admission of these are my biases. Here's mm-hmm. how I look at it. You know, take what you can from it. Oh, and that's also the great argument for, like, 
literally learn from as many varied sources as you can because everybody like I have my biases. I do. <laughs> it's just built in. You know, I have the things that I know work for me and then the things that don't. And every person out there that has their system does. Now, they were probably they got upon that, hopefully, by uh, varied sources over time. But that's like I've had people come in and shadow me. And then they're almost like apologetic. They'll, hey, I, I want to go learn from them. And like they're really standoffish telling me that. I'm like, yes, please do. Go, go. You know? And a lot of coaches won't do that. It's like, I want you to go learn from other people. I am not the holy grail. Like, holy shit, go, go get knowledge from as many sources as you can. And there's a lot of people in the industry that are not like that. No, um, Phil, that's because like, you're not a guru. To me, a, yeah. <laughs> a guru is someone who expects submission from yes. their cult of personality. Yeah, and and like this, you this is the one way. You have to do it this way or you suck. You know? <laughs> and it centers around oftentimes yeah. an individual. Like, yes. yeah, you don't want Phil yep. worshipers. That's not going to help. Yeah. You know, It feeds your ego, but that's about it. It's yeah. like all the checkies. Holy shit. Oh. Like Paul Check was a big one on that. <laughs> oh, my God. There was a eight million carbon copies of his crazy ass rolling around for a long time. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah. I've often said the industry is full of a bunch of parrots. Yeah. And it's usually yeah. not the person at the top that I disagree with. It's all the followers of yes. that person. Yes. Because they can't. The answer is. You know, because Paul Check said, or because Mike Boyle said, or because whoever or Stegen yeah. said, it's like, okay, cool, that's a good starting point. But like, what do you think? How did you yeah. get to that answer? And they're like, well, I don't know. The guru said, I'm like, oh yes. god, <laughs> right? Well, cool. and that's right. the problem is that the lead parrot isn't the one squawking the most. It's the, the fucking cops. right. Yeah, it's yeah. like, bah, 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 shut the fuck up. <laughs> <laughs> don't understand no, why. And right, that's right. one the big thing I always told my clients, like any new client that walks in, like if I tell you to do something and you want to know why, ask me. If I can't fucking tell you why we're doing this, then I'm I'm messing up. I yep. should be able to tell you why we're doing anything we're doing and give you a answer besides because I said. <laughs> yes. So well, I think a lot of those parrots, they're on board because, again, they're trying to ride coattails and make a living yes. off of something oh, yeah. that seems catchy. That's yep. the problem with this. And I, I should point out, when I talk about systems, if you're a highly educated person in the different ways that we talked about that you can get educated, you're allowed to come up with, hey, I look at it like this. I'm going to call these categories these things. Mm -hmm. um, you might hear them called X or Y, but this is how I'm going to do it. If somebody is truly has tons of experience and education, then I don't have as much of a problem. It's when you get these influencers who just come up with this crap. They just pull it out of their behind. Yeah. It's like now, no. <laughs> you, you have a system because you want to sell it, because you want to package an information product. But there are people better at that than you are. Like sit down before you hurt yourself or somebody else. But what you said at the beginning, Phil, and I know we're out of time, is – the question today is not so much practicing and getting hired by a university or a big hospital fitness chain or something looking for a certain cert. But if you just for your own knowledge and, and your buddies, what do you look for? Yeah. A lot of the times it's, the rules are the same. Yeah. You're still looking for something that doesn't have as much of a party line. You try to stay agnostic, learn what you can from different sources yep. and look for those universal truths yep. that are out there. There are a few. Yep. Yeah. And I would add real quick that I'm obviously biased because I sell the Flex Diet Cert, but when I created it, my thing was, can I make it an actual system based on my own bias, which is metabolic flexibility, flexible dieting, but could I pull, you know, 12 different other PhDs to, you know, do interviews and have specific information and then have it be based on research within an actual true system? Because like you were saying, Lonnie, I don't, most of these people who market a system, I don't think it's a true system. They've never even taken any systems courses, period. It's just the latest anabolic fasting or whatever the latest term is. And then they go, oh, this is my system. It's like, no, yep. that's just based off of one idea. There's no systematic viewpoint at all. But system sounds cool, so we'll call it a system. Yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. All right. All right, guys. Until yeah. next week, I hope yep, that helps somebody. <laughs> <laughs> All right, see you later. Right. Yeah.
Iron Radio is accepting donations. If you like what we do, the professors, the scientists, the bodybuilding show promoters, the athletes themselves in powerlifting and bodybuilding, um, please consider making a donation or maybe buying something from the ironradio.org store. Uh, We also are accepting supporting members. So for $4 a month, which is frankly less than the bank sneaks out of your account in fees, you can step up and support a form of sort of public radio for the bodybuilding and powerlifting and strength community. The Iron Radio Podcast and all of the audio on ironradio.org is for informational purposes only. If you're interested in starting a diet or exercise program, it's important to check with your physician. Also seek the help of registered dietitians, athletic trainers, 